Welcome to the Unseminary Podcast. Are you looking for practical ministry help to drive your ministry further, faster? Have a sinking feeling that your ministry training didn't prepare you for the real world? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others in pursuit of stuff that we wish they had taught in seminary. Buckle up and let's get started with this week's Unseminary Podcast. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Unseminary Podcast. Happy Thursday. Hopefully you're having a great week as we get ready for this weekend of ministry at your church. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to take some time uh, to invest in your own leadership today, to put us into your earbuds and to listen in on this conversation. I'm super excited to have Tim Stevens with us today. Tim uh, is a part of, I think your title is like team leader or something like that at Vander Blumen Search right. Group. Before that, he was in Granger at Granger Community Church in uh, Granger, Indiana. So I'm super excited to have uh, Tim on the show today. Tim, welcome. So glad to be here. Thanks for giving me a few minutes to talk to your, uh, your friends and uh, your audience. Oh, thank you so much. I, I'm glad to have you uh, today along for the ride. So obviously you've spent a lot of time thinking about teams and leadership and, and that sort of thing. I wonder if you could give us kind of the Tim Stevens story, kind of who is Tim Stevens for people who don't know and kind of a bit of your background and where you are today and that sort of thing. Yeah, so started my, I've been in ministry now for almost 30 years, but I started my career at a nonprofit organization uh, called Life Action Ministries, and I uh, spent nine years there and uh, had a tremendous run there. Started attending uh, a, ch- a little just startup church when I was working there called Granger Community Church, meeting in a movie theater uh, in uh, South Bend area, South Bend, Indiana. And um, and just was like, okay, this is weird. I've been working with churches for nine years, but this is different. Uh, this is a church uh, that's reaching people that I have not seen a lot of churches reach. And so very appealing to me. And I uh, was asked to come on staff. The church was about five, six years old. I was, the, I think, the fifth uh, staff member at the time. And uh, so meeting in a very small room around a table, basically, was uh, <laughs> how we did it, 300 people in the church. Um, and uh, d- did a number of things in those early years. Uh, within a couple years, was asked to be the executive pastor. And it was just a fun ride. I was there for 20, 11 days shy of 20 years. I don't want to exaggerate. <laughs> Round numbers, twenty years, um, yeah. and uh, and we saw the church, you know, grow into the thousands. We were able to um, see uh, significant ministry done both in the community um, and around the world. A lot of work that we uh, were doing, and the church still continues to do in southern India. Um, saw over eighteen hundred churches start there, mm. uh, and and just a. a a fun, uh, exciting ride uh, to be able to you know be a part of that. When I left, we had. Uh, just just early this summer, we had 129 staff members, uh, several multi-sites, uh, a, a preschool. We were doing a, a restaurant that was an outreach um, out of the uh, church campus there to reach people during the week. And, uh, and you know, just a, a tremendous team. Mm-hmm. But uh, kind of God, God led me uh, away from there, said kind of your, your season is done, your time is done, and just felt great peace about that. When I made that decision, I didn't know exactly what that meant, where I'd be going. But um, but about three years prior, I had uh, hired Vanderbloom and Search Group to help us find a campus pastor. And it was a positive experience mm. and didn't think much about it after that. But then the summer, uh, as I was kind of considering what the next chapter is, it just seemed like a natural fit. Um, mm. I get the opportunity to uh, work with pastors and churches still, which I love. I get the opportunity to uh, find great talent, which was one of the most favorite things I did at Granger, and I get the chance to uh, lead a team, and mm-hmm. so that's exciting as well. So it's it's a great fit. I'm I'm all of like three months old here now, so <laughs> still very new. I'm still mu- very much in the honeymoon season. So you found you found the bathroom in the office. That's basically what you. I, I know done where to park my car. Yeah, that's. <laughs> That's about as good as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, with a hundred and some odd, you know, staff on your team at Granger, and obviously with what you're doing in your day job now, um, you know, obviously you've you spent a lot of time thinking about how do you get great people to come on to your team. Sure. Um, you know, what have you done on that front? What are some of those things that you know we should be thinking about when we're we're trying to bring great people onto our teams? Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting that uh, you know if you think about when people want to join your team. Um, Often what they do first is what? They give you a resume. Right. And in my work now, we see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of resumes. We, we get probably four to 500 resumes a week. Oh, my goodness. Um, wow. Now, resumes uh, tend to contain your uh, education, 
and your job experience, mm-hmm. which are both valuable pieces of information. But in, in the realm of everything that I'm looking for when I hire someone, um, those two are probably the smallest pieces of the puzzle. Um, and so in some cases, resumes are worthless. I actually have a chapter in my book called Resumes Are Worthless. And <laughs> a little bit of an overkill, you know, try attention getting chapter title. But it kind of speaks to the fact that there's so much related to um, hiring uh, staff that is beyond experience and uh, education. And that would be uh, character. You know, mm. character is so huge and so important, especially when we're hiring for church ministry. Mm. We don't have time to help someone um, uh, learn not to steal or learn to keep their pants zipped or learn <laughs> to be honest. Um, they have to come you know, on staff with a certain level of that. Um, other things such as uh, uh, chemistry is, mm-hmm. is huge. You know, mm-hmm. just both chemistry uh, co- slash culture fit with the church. Mm-hmm. Every church has a unique DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm finding that more in my current role. That And, and it's, I think, a God-given DNA most mm-hmm. of the time. Um, and it's not a right or wrong. It just It's just kind it of a thumbprint. It, it yeah. is what it is. And it's what makes them unique. And it's so... Mm-hmm. Culture fits huge in chemistry with the team. You can have someone with great experience and with an amazing pedigree and who even uh, kind of fits the culture, but you just don't love going to lunch with them. And right. there's, you know, the chemistry just isn't there. And so that's, that's huge. Um, how do you, how do you test for, you know, kind of looping back on a couple of those things? So, sure. you know, you're inter- interacting with someone, you see a bunch of resumes on your desk. Um, you know, and you're trying to figure out that both those issues, either the kind of character or or culture fit, how are you um, trying to test for those and understand those, even on the early end, trying to make some, you know, assessments as you're weeding through those resumes? Yeah, I think, um, so two answers to that. One would be as a, as a pastor, as I was for 20 years uh, in a church setting, and then the second part of that would be as a, now a search consultant helping churches mm-hmm. find. But as a pastor, man, you've got such an advantage uh, because you have a, a congregation with dozens or hundreds or thousands, depending mm-hmm. on the size of the church, of uh, people that you see their character, you see their fit, you know mm-hmm. the culture, uh, whether they get the culture or not. And so it's really, uh, it's an advantage that, you know, most employers, corporate employers, whatever, don't have, they don't have that advantage. Um, mm-hmm. They just see, you know, your best in an interview or see your best on a resume. And so, you know, I think uh, look, d- digging into that uh, when you're hiring someone, boy, if you can find someone, and I, I say this as a search consultant, but if you can hire someone from inside your church first, mm-hmm. boy, is the best way to do it. You Okay. You know so much about their strengths and weaknesses. You've seen them lead teams. You've seen how they interact with the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've watched their, their life. You know their uh, how they handle their marriage. You, you know all that stuff. And so mm-hmm. uh, the 129 staff we had, 123 of them had been hired from within the church. Wow. Uh, so big fan of that. Um, as a uh, uh, the second part of that answer then is now mm-hmm. as a search consultant. So we really dig in. One of the things that, that we uh, try to do really well is dig in and understand the culture mm. and uh, understand exactly what it is that makes, you know, that makes when you when you cut that person and they bleed Harvest Church or Grace Chapel or whatever the name mm-hmm. of the church is, what is that? What right. is that uh, secret sauce that makes them who they are? And so we spend a lot of time on the front side trying to figure not only – you know, who are they, what position are they trying to fill or uh, what kind of person do they want, but what's the culture of mm. that? Mm-hmm. Interesting. All right, so let's assume for a moment that we've got this great team of people around us. They're incredible folks. We're just so glad to have them. We're building them up. They're qualified. Sure. They're making a big difference. They're, you know, kicking whatever and taking names. Um, <laughs> how do we build the kind of culture that will keep those folks? I know, I think that's uh, for anyone who's who's had... Um, you know, any size of team, that's a real issue. You know, you want, you think about that. How do we, um, you know, retain the people we've got, ensure they feel super happy and fired up, um, and then ultimately build a kind of culture that will attract other folks? Sure. Yeah, some, you know, some quick thoughts on that. Um, and these might seem oversimplistic um, just because we only have a couple minutes, but mm-hmm. I think they're important. Uh, one thing is just uh, creating a culture where you have fun, uh, mm-hmm. where it's not just all business, it's not just all transactionalists, it's not just all every time you're face-to-face with your staff that you're getting stuff done, mm-hmm. but you actually are creating space uh, to have some fun, to hang out. Um, 
you know, and not just required fun, uh, you know, the party that everyone has to go to. Right, but, the Christmas but, party. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but space for uh, just just for people to kind of let down and be mm-hmm. able to um, have some of that important community time together. Mm-hmm. I think another thing is, I think one of the probably most important ingredients of building culture that uh, we did at Granger for years and uh, that we started doing early on is um, is a staff meeting and that's going to sound like oh well great everyone has a staff meeting <laughs> so it wasn't the fact that we had a staff meeting it was right. it was the ingredients of that um, mm. and so there was two or three things that we did in that every week our staff meeting and I'm t- talking about all, all staff so everyone's in the room our staff meeting had nothing to do with getting stuff done mm. uh, it was it was really a culture building hour uh, every week so we would spend uh, 15 or 20 minutes together as a staff um, just telling stories. Where have you seen God at work in the life of the church in the last seven to ten days? Hmm. And you know, everyone from facility care people to the um, leadership team uh, to everyone in between can tell stories and can hear stories. And it, it just kind of breaks you out of your. You know, sometimes we get just so focused in our mm. in a specific area. You know, we're doing students, and it feels like we're the only ones doing anything, and right. nothing else is getting done. And it just kind of breaks you out of that, and it and. You might be in a position where you don't see as much actual fruit like facility care, like uh, grounds or maintenance or the receptionist or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so being able to see, oh, wait, what I'm doing is important. Mm-hmm. And and just hearing that God's doing stuff, sometimes the numbers aren't great. And so it's like if you're just looking at stats on a piece of paper, it seems like nothing's happening. But when you right. hear stories, then you see stuff's happening. Uh, so that that kind of those kind of culture building exercises. Did, did you do that meeting? Uh, we- once a week, did you say, with everybody, like the so whole 129? Yeah, everyone. In fact, even our part-time people that might be 10 hours a week, as mm-hmm. much as possible, we said we want you to orient an hour of your week uh, for the staffing. We did it on Wednesdays, m- middle of the day, 11.30 in the morning, and uh, and and tended to have 80% plus participation. Uh, wow. And it was a, you know, if you're in town, this is kind of what we do at, on Wednesdays at 1130. Interesting. Wow, that's that's amazing. I, You know, I think a, a lot of churches have a hard time getting, a lot smaller churches have a hard time getting people together once a month, let alone once a week. So that's, uh, you know, that that's incredible. Anything else on the kind of staff culture front, you'd say, some important stuff to kind of wrestle through? Yeah, I would say a couple things. If you're if you're one of the ones in leadership, you have a team, whether you're the lead mm-hmm. pastor or you have a, a your director that has a team, uh, a couple things there. I'd say one would be, um, giving uh, authority with responsibility. Mm. Uh, a lot of times what we tend to do is give responsibility, but they have to keep coming back to us for the answers. Um, so they have, you know, they have a certain amount of authority, but not enough really to do their jobs. And that's okay if you want to attract a team that isn't a high, that where you don't have a team full of high capacity leaders. If you want like really strong, get it done, leaders that will really uh, move the, the mission and the vision forward with you and really shake the kingdom, then they're, those kind of leaders, they want to be able to, to make decisions and mm-hmm. to have authority and to get stuff done. It's not a power play or power grab. It's just how God's wired them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and a lot of times, when, and especially like a church that's small growing towards mid-sized uh, will struggle with this where it's just really hard because one person has been in charge for a long time mm-hmm. and now it's starting to grow and you're starting to give responsibility away and that's that's very difficult. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I would just recommend uh, if to find great leaders and then let them, you know, let them lead. Mm-hmm. Not You're not letting them lead from day one because you're wanting to grow them up into the culture of the church and mm-hmm. especially if you've hired them from outside. But ultimately to, to hand that off. And the other thing I would say related to, uh, to that and leading the team as the leader, uh, everyone's looking to you for the answers. Mm, mm-hmm. um, but don't walk around giving people answers. Mm. Uh, I think the best leaders are walking around asking questions right, and so true. constantly desiring to learn and, uh, and, and not assuming they're the smartest person in the room. In fact, assuming the opposite, assuming that there are people smarter than them in given topics than they are. And so constantly desiring to learn. And you will gain, it's counterintuitive because if you ask a lot of questions, you think that they will think I don't know anything, and you mm-hmm. will think then that I will lose my position or my my place for leadership. And the opposite actually happens. People respect you uh, when you respect them, mm-hmm. and um, they their opinion grows and their and your your stature grows because you're willing to listen and you're willing to learn. 
Nice. Well, you've got a book coming out in January. I actually pre-ordered it right before we uh, we started the, uh, the the conversation here on Amazon. So fairness, fairness. Or I was gonna say fairness. I could fairness write one. Of fairness <laughs> is overrated, and fifty-one other leadership principles to revolutionize your workplace. So now, what is this about? Um, you know, t give us kind of the the, the insight onto why you wrote this book. So this is kind of a. Um a book just to kind of boil down um, my thoughts and philosophy of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's it comes from probably you know my most recent five or ten years at Granger, mm -hmm. um, and my experience there in leading the team there and and leading the ministry through growth there with the rest of the team. And so I kind of boil it down into uh, four segments. Uh, the book is the first segment is on. Uh, uh, being a leader worth following, uh, mm -hmm. all about kind of integrity and the stuff that, that needs to be a foundation of our personal lives in order to be strong leaders. Uh, the second is on finding great, finding a great team, building a great team. You know, how do you find staff, um, some on hiring, some on firing, some on conflict navigation. Um, the third segment's on building a great culture. Mm. And, uh, and once you have the great team, how do you maintain the great team and build the culture? And then the fourth segment is on, um, leading through crisis or transition or leading through great change. Um, most leaders, if you think of any great leader uh, in history, you probably can think of their leadership through some transition that they led mm, through. So true. Yep. So 99 days out of 100, uh, maybe in the church it's only 89 days out of 100. <laughs> are pretty normal. But you'll have 10 days, 10% of the time, where you've got something you've got to lead through, and it just requires um, – what's already been built in your life and what's already true about you to be able to lead through that with with strength. And so hmm. the book is focused uh, equal parts towards um, pastors and church leaders and Christian leaders in the marketplace. Very cool. uh, and I really tried to balance that uh, uh, equally um, because so much of it's transferable uh, mm -hmm. from marketplace to to church leadership. Nice. Well, I'd encourage people listening in to get a chance to order it. I, Tim's one of those guys I trust. Look forward to reading it and look forward to hearing what uh, what you have to say and, and learning from that. Uh, just one last question before we jump into the lightning round. You know, I, I love the fact that you're, um, you know, because you've been a, such an advocate for, and you, you mentioned it earlier. I wasn't going to say it, but you mentioned it, how so many of your staff at Granger were internal rather than external. And now you're working for a search organization. Has that created internal tension uh, in your own world or no? Oh. That's a great question. Uh, it really hasn't. So my experience when I hired Vanderblumen was we had someone internally we were looking at, oh, nice. uh, and so Vanderblumen came alongside of us and said, uh, you know, we'll look, we'll help you determine mm -hmm. if this person is the right for your position, and we'll bring others. And there's no uh, there's no um, you know skin in the game as far as uh, you know when we come alongside a church. Whether, whether they hire someone from inside or outside doesn't matter to us at all as long as we can help them find the right person for that job. So um, a lot of times what uh, pastors and leaders have a hard time, and I had a hard time of this, is you know Sundays are so regular. So and, and for any level of staff, you got things that are just happening. So one, you don't typically have the training uh, to hire. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're not trained as a personnel recruiter or whatever. So there's that. And then secondly, you just don't have the time that it requires to focus. And you don't have the, um, the margin to get it wrong. Right. Uh, and any, any of us who have hired someone and got it wrong, oh, and we know the months, sometimes you might be a couple years that you lose uh, yeah. in that process. And so we just like to come alongside pastors and help kind of take that burden off their plate. And if they have some internal candidates they want us to look at, um, totally will. And some churches will hire uh, internal candidates after we've gone through a process and some will hire external yeah. um, ones that we can find. Very cool. Yeah, we've been, been through that pain of, yeah. gosh, that was the wrong hire for sure. This is the Unseminary Podcast. Stuff you wish they taught in seminary. Well, we're going to jump into the lightning round. This is the part of the show where we ask similar questions of everyone who's on the show today. Super excited to have Tim Stevens with us. A great leader. Um, one of those folks you should take some time to uh, listen in, uh, in on and, and follow. So, uh, Tim, what's an online resource that you're using these days that's just been particularly helpful for you? Yeah, so one uh, new one that I've just started using, it's called Wonderlist, oh, nice. W-U-N-D-R-L-I-S-T. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll use it personally. It's just basically a to-do list that can be synced across devices and synced, across, synced with your team. Nice. Uh, so use it for uh, both personally, um, various lists, as well as with our leadership team. That's how we like establish our agendas for our weekly leadership meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, we just all can 
add things to the wonder list and then we sit there Friday mornings and go through it. Cool. Uh, what's a book you've read in the last six months to a year that's had an impact on your thinking? So one I, I read recently, it's called The New Gold Standard, mm. and it's, a, it's the story of uh, the Ritz-Carlton. Yep. Not necessarily the story, uh, more uh, some background to how they service guests. And I just think mm. any church leader or business owner, uh, it'd be a great book to read because kind of how they think about their guests and how they think about their staff. Hmm. It just kind of takes it to a, a new level. Well, I think you're the third person to mention that book, so I, I guess I've got to get it on my list. So <laughs> You better get it on the list. Add, add it to your wonder list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, is there another ministry that you're looking to these days that you're finding particularly inspiring? You know, um, one cool thing about my job now is I get to work with a ton of churches. Yeah, and that so is cool. It seems like, and, and uh, many churches outside of circles that I've typically ran in, and so mm -hmm. that's pretty fun and pretty cool. And Honestly, I, I'm, I come away inspired by something at every church I visit. Um, mm -hmm. Recently at a, a smaller uh, United Congregational or United Church of Christ uh, church in the New York City area that mm -hmm. was very encouraging. We're working with Harvest Church in Billings, Montana, very encouraging. Crossroads Grace in Manteca, California. So, uh, yes, uh, mm -hmm. I'm inspired by <laughs> uh, specifically local churches of all sizes. It's very cool to see what God's doing through, through local churches. Very cool. All right. If you could get 15 minutes with any leader alive today, pick their brain, get to know, learn from them a little bit, who would that be and why? Do you know, um, I think uh, George W. Bush, nice. uh, not from, a, I mean, there's, there's plenty about his, le his leadership or his decisions that I agreed with and disagreed with, mm -hmm. but he seemed to be a leader who was always very confident in mm -hmm. direction and very unmoved by what people thought. Hmm. And I remember him saying, you know, several times when, when he would be interviewed, he, he would just say, you know, history will determine that. That's not right. up to me. And, it, and it's almost as though, you know, I'm, I'm making decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm making the best ones I can. We'll figure out, you know, in the future whether they were the right or the wrong decisions. And I just really kind of respect that confidence and that stability. I'd love to pick his brain about that. Absolutely. Very cool. And now that I live in Texas, I'm closer to him. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe you'll run into him one day. Maybe I'll run into him. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, when, you're, when you're not out helping churches find great leaders or help them build great teams, what do you do for fun just to kind of kick back in your own personal life? How do you relax? Uh, I love to play tennis. Oh, uh, nice. And, uh, and that's, that's I've gotten back into that the last two years. I love anything. I love home projects, you know, the handyman projects, building stuff. Um, I, I will around here. I'm in Houston while my family is still in Indiana here for uh, the next little while. So I got some free time in the evenings. I'll just walk through houses under construction. I, I just love the smell of lumber. I love to walk through a Home Depot, just walk the aisles. It's just, it just uh, it's very invigorating for me. Oh, uh, gosh, I, I respect that. We redid our uh, kitchen, or I should say this. I had a friend of mine redo our kitchen <laughs> this spring. And so my job was the go to Home Depot guy. Okay. Um, go and get this, go and get this. And um, I'm just all thumbs when I go in there. I just It's all <laughs> foreign to me. So Tim, I really appreciate you being on the show today. If people want to get in touch with you or with Vanderblumen or, you know, how can they do that? How can they get in touch with your organization? Yeah. So I, I blog at leadingsmart.com. And so that's a great way to tune in. My email's on there as well. But, um, but also a, an easy way to get me is tim at leadingsmart.com. That's great. easier to smell than, spell than Vanderblumen. So <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, and Twitter uh, at Tim A. Stevens, Tim A. Stevens. Perfect. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. We'll, uh, we'll link to the, uh, the Fairness is Overrated book as well on the, the show notes. So thank you so much for, for being here today and just really appreciate you sharing with us. Awesome. Thanks for the time. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Unseminary podcast. Don't be shy. We'd love to connect. Check out Unseminary Inbox. You can sign up at unseminary.com and we'll send you helpful training resources every week. Plus, you'll gain immediate access to our exclusive members area with tons of resources you can use. Connect with Rich on Twitter at Rich Birch or through email rich at unseminary.com. Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode at unseminary.com. It includes links to what we talked about today and more. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Did you enjoy today's episode? Drop by iTunes and leave a review. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's Unseminary podcast. Join us next week when we'll learn more stuff we wish they taught in seminary. <laughs>